Hello there. This is a bit of a special video because this is a Commodore VIC-20 and this happens to be the first vintage computer I ever bought as a vintage computer. And it was also the first thing I ever tried to make a video about before I started the channel and even before I actually tried numbering the videos. So I can't even say that this would have been project number blank because it predates that. Um, there's a reason though that I was trying to make a video about it. This is the computer itself and it doesn't work. It has never worked. I have taken it apart and tried to investigate it. I actually found that the main axial capacitor for the power filtering was corroded. That's where the photo came from that I used in the video about reforming capacitors. But I never really solved what was wrong with it. The only hint I ever had was, I'm going to show you some video capture from 2016, this weird pattern that it output. Now I'm not familiar with the VIC-20 and I didn't really have any other diagnostic leads to go on. So this thing just kind of sat in a box. I was hoping I would stumble across a second VIC-20 to try and fix mine, even just if it was an example, but one never really showed up. However, recently someone I know got a VIC-20 and it was broken. They needed it fixed and that also gave me the opportunity to check mine against theirs to potentially see what's wrong with them. But uh, this one is a completely different revision of VIC-20. I uh, didn't know that was a thing so it wasn't as helpful as I thought. And it turned out that one was dead in a very easy way. Its VIC chip was bad so I just transplanted mine into that one so at least one of them could work. So I was pretty much resigned to say that one is dead and probably never coming back. Until a couple of days ago. This is a third VIC-20. This one's completely untested. And uh, this was given to me by Wesley in Queen Creek, Arizona. Along with actually a number of other really cool things. But today we're gonna focus on this. Um, because this is the same revision of VIC-20 as mine and may have a good VIC chip, which could allow two out of three of these computers to live. Additionally, it may also just work. I doubt it, but maybe. So we're going to see what I can get working today and if I can get my first vintage computer ever up and running again. All right, we're gonna start this off by seeing what shape the VIC-20 that Wesley gave me is in. This came from a Goodwill like this. No power supply, no RF modulator, nothing. Now that is all critical because there are power supply differences between the VIC-20s. This is the nine volt, actually 10 volt AC only power supply that goes to these Rev F, I believe, VIC-20s. And uh, you also need the RF modulator breakout box to get any video out of it. However, when I got the other VIC-20 working that is not mine, I discovered that my RF modulator box doesn't work. Now, I haven't opened this to take a look at what may be wrong with it yet, but I have the RF modulator that goes with the other person's VIC-20, so I can use this one. We'll check out what's going on with this one today um, because I may want to cap map it. Now, I'm not going to just do diagnostics here. I actually have a full set of electrolytic replacement capacitors for my VIC-20. For the first time ever, I'm actually going to try recapping it and see if that works. Um, I've just had uh, very little aspirations that it would live. And frankly, uh, even if I had recapped it, I now know it wouldn't have worked because I would have needed another RF modulator box. So having multiple units in play is gonna be the solution to figuring out something here, I think. So let me get this thing set up and then we'll see what we're looking at here. You know, I was just about to reach over and plug this in when I realized the obvious thing. Um, chances are electrolytics are bad in this too. So actually, let's open this thing up first and uh, see if it's even going to have a chance of working before we try and put power into it.
Okay, uh, there's weird bug residue in here, uh, but that capacitor looks okay. Uh, this one is one of the ones that has obviously failed on mine, and actually, it also looks okay. The fuse is not blown. So I'm inclined to just try this to start. Uh, the RF shield here hides a few more electrolytics. And I don't see any obvious signs of those being bad in there. There's the Vic chip. Uh, this one is dated 82. So I'm just gonna try powering it. Everything looks okay from what I can visually inspect. It's all connected, so... Okay, maybe three. Ah, okay, not looking good. Oh, oh! It, you're kidding me. <laughs> it just works. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, the space bar doesn't work. It's bad. We need a new computer. <laughs> yeah, the space bar doesn't work, but come on, out of all of the problems you could possibly have. <laughs> well, like I said, this one working means that uh, I have a really good diagnostic candidate for my other one. Um, <laughs> so... Let's go ahead and uh, see what it would take to get the uh, first Vic I got working. Um, yeah, also I could try its keyboard on this one at least to see if that would make this one uh, be able to type space. All right, my keyboard on this one and spacebar does work. So the spacebar of this unit is bad somehow. Okay, so let's really start to get into the details here. So this is the new one that works, and this is my original one. Now, these are the same revision of board as far as I can tell. However, they do appear to have made at different production plants for the PCBs at least. Uh, I gotta say, the silk screen on my original one is a lot nicer looking. That one is a little dusty, but this one is just, it's also got like this really cool satin look to it. Um, not that it matters in the slightest. Now, you can see a little hack job repair I attempted in here to get this working after that original axial cap fuzzed up. This is technically the same set of values, but it just never worked. Uh, I can tell you for sure this capacitor is bad, and we're going to go ahead and try and replace all of them here and see if that works. I'm hoping, maybe, they're shorting out the 5-volt power supply and that just replacing them will bring it back to life, although this one now has a bad Vic chip in it, so I'll try swapping between these two just to see if that solves anything. There are other likely candidates in here, like we can see two MOS produced CIA chips. This one has uh, what appears to be ST produced uh, <laughs> CIA chips. Might make them a little more reliable. Um, so yeah, uh, we have our work cut out for us. Now, like I said, we're gonna be putting all new electrolytics in here. Uh, but to work on a VIC-20 is very, very annoying because when you first get one of these that's going to have this RF shield soldered to the bottom, uh, I would show you on this one, but you also have to take out a bunch of screws and that one works, so why mess with it? Uh, this one has been disassembled for a very long time because I tried to work on it, so I already have the RF shield desoldered. It really isn't very fun. I wish they didn't do that. Now, the next thing that's annoying is this is a shield that goes over. Actually, I think it's more of a heat sink, but it goes over this uh, chip here and it sort of threads in. At least mine doesn't really thread that well anymore um, onto whatever that is, a diode thing. I don't know. Then they have this weird jumper link cable because they couldn't route those last two traces, I guess. After that, you have mostly access to everything. Uh, we have what I believe is a five volt regulator right here because again, this one uses an AC input only power supply. Later VIC-20 power supplies did include five volt in this, which makes this a uh, 
bit of a scarier power supply, so I kind of don't mind this one just being a transformer only unit. For now, I want to take out that capacitor there and show you just how bad it is. I haven't actually removed it myself yet, and I'm curious to see it's a little clearer. It's just pretty obvious uh, when I look at it from the bottom uh, that it's got some bad stuff going on. Finally, it let go, and you can see a little bit of corrosion building up on the lead there. So that is not a good capacitor. It also looks like it may have, yeah, damaged some traces. So yeah, there are definitely problems with this thing. Well, it is actually still working. Now I already have a listing on CapsWiki for all of these, so I know which ones go where, and they have the polarities pretty well marked on the board. So I'm just gonna pull up all of the capacitors from here so I can see what damage to the PCB may have happened. After getting all of the capacitors out, I looked at the bottoms of them to see which ones were failing and noticed that it was only the Ace brand caps that were actually starting to leak. All of the other ones were fine. Well, after seeing that, I'm actually increasingly positive of the outlook of this thing with uh, new capacitors installed, so hopefully that solves it. That would be really awesome to have this one working too. Uh, after so many years, it feels weird that that's even a possibility. Well, I didn't look at the traces. Uh, the traces on all those capacitors are, yeah, one of them took a bit of a damage, but overall they look okay. Um, but yeah, if I can get this thing working, that would be kind of hilarious, um, but also a little sad I didn't try sooner. It's just, it's been one of those things just like eating it away at the back of my mind and being one of the first projects I tried to tackle seemed excessively daunting. I'm gonna give you the abridged version of the capacitor replacement here because there were a number of problems that I was not expecting that I had to solve. The board was much more damaged by the corrosion than I had initially realized for one, and some of the traces were unusable and I had to bridge the legs over to make contact where the capacitors needed to go. Additionally, C25 in this, I ended up not actually ordering. It turned out I'd missed it when I was trying to spec out what capacitors this thing has. Luckily, the ABIT BP6 that I recapped a while ago had an identical value and footprint capacitor. So, since I'd ordered extras of those, I was able to reuse one of those capacitors for this board. With that, I was able to replace all of the capacitors, though it took quite a bit longer than I initially expected. But with that done, I can try testing my VIC-20 for the first time ever with an actual possibility of it working, since it doesn't have a bunch of bad, likely shorted capacitors in it. All right, now just for giggles, uh, we'll test it with the known bad VIC chip first, because wouldn't it be hilarious if it works in this one, but not the other one? So let's see what happens. I expect nothing, okay, and it should stay at static and never properly form a video signal. Now I'm going to swap the VIC chips again. That one is known bad, so that was just a, you know, maybe miracles happen test. Now this is a kind of stupid swap that I'm about to do because uh, the VIC chip that was in this computer actually works. It's just in the other VIC-20 that's not mine, um, and this one is about to get the VIC chip from the currently known good computer. So it feels a little dumb to musical chairs this, but uh, the other one's not open right now. So we're just gonna do this for the moment. Now one more time with a known good VIC chip. It's looking more promising. I think the uh, other one booted up by now though. Oh yeah, doesn't look like that's uh, gonna be the extent of the issues on this one. <sighs> oh well. All right, and as a sanity check, good chip, good computer, good results. Now I could do actual circuit level diagnostics of this one, but um, I kind of just want to try swapping all the chips that say MOS on them between the two of these and see if that makes a difference because I really don't trust chips made by them. So uh, yeah, I figure that wouldn't hurt to try. So what I think I'm actually gonna do is put these chips in that unit 
uh, because then it would just be 100% down to one part. That's bad. And worst case, uh, tells me what parts are uh, still viable from this thing. So I'm going to time lapse through that and uh, see how it goes. Whoa. Hold on a minute. No way! <laughs> okay, this is a little wonky because I messed up the calibration. Um, that is my original Vic 20 booting after UE11 failed. Um, that looks like a custom chip. Um, hopefully it's a basic ROM, uh, but, uh, yes! <laughs> oh man, it can live! It can work! Oh man! I never had a hope of making this thing work without having a direct swap part to try out. Oh my gosh! And again, an MOS chip is bad. All right, I think theoretically um, the system should be able to boot without this if you have a cartridge. Now, I only like within the last year bought my first cartridge and I never thought that uh, this thing was ever gonna work. Plus I knew the capacitors were bad, so I didn't try it. But I'm just curious now, if I plug in a cartridge without the basic ROM installed, will it work? Also, uh, for giggles here, I went digging through all of my uh, EEPROMs, and I do actually have some 24-pin uh, chips, but they are um, 2732s, and I think this needs to be a 2364 to write one, and I don't really have any others. I also found the original axial capacitor for this one, which is Ace brand, um, and super leaky like all the others. So that's not surprising, but I'm curious here. Yeah. Oh, okay then. Now the other person who owns the good computer that I put my Vic chip into has a Pentultimate Plus 2 cartridge, and with the bad chip pulled, this thing fully passes now. So that is awesome. Um, interestingly, if I go ahead and pull the basic ROM and put the bad one back in, um, I will attempt to run the dead test again here. And uh, first off, that light turns green, which I don't believe should happen. And uh, it's supposed to have the test run uh, I think when you release the button, I'm not 100% sure how this works. There is some heat coming from that ROM, so that's a thing. But yeah, the uh, dead test cartridge is not working <laughs> with that ROM in there. I'm guessing there's something wrong electrically with that chip, and it's just dragging it down uh, at the uh, voltage rail or something. So that would uh, explain why it's so weird, because yeah, it's just uh, not doing anything there. Now, with this thing in its known fully functional state, there's still one more thing I need to test, and that is my RF modulator. Uh, despite this being a working VIC-20, it's not my RF modulator, and uh, I don't think mine does work. So let's find out uh, if maybe it'll work <laughs> with that, and uh, having recapped this section, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess not. Um, make sure it's set to channel four and yeah. So that's, <laughs> it wants to live, but uh, yeah, this thing clearly not working correctly here. So this is bad. Oh, really? 
It's just an off-the-shelf RF modulator? That's hilarious. Okay. And inside, there are two electrolytic caps and a bunch of junk. You know, actually, could it just possibly be out of spec? Oh, um, hey. <laughs> That's a thing. Um... That's me tuning whatever the plastic knob is um, to the minimum or maximum. Not sure how you want to think about it. Um, it's not good. There's definitely some stuff funky going on. The tuning inductor doesn't seem to change anything. But yeah, that thing. Um, huh. I bet that uh, I might need to replace the two capacitors in there. But you know what? That is a real good start and good sign that that thing actually can live. Um, okay. That is amazing. Um, maybe not perfect on the RF modulator, and I think I can just get a composite cable to use instead, so I may not worry about that any farther. But by the end of this, I should have a fully functional VIC-20, though I started with the fully functional VIC-20 with the one that Wesley gave me. And here's what I'm going to do, actually. I am going to put all of the chips that came from that VIC-20 back into it. And it will be kept intact. My bad VIC-20, I can't accept an easy win like that on. Um, I want to fully fix it. So it's getting its bad character ROM back in here. And uh, it'll be getting the bad Vic chip. This didn't originally come with it. I do have that one still in the other one, but for the moment, uh, it's going to have the bad one in it. Now, I could get its good Vic chip back from the other one and put it in here, but the uh, other person needs a Vic chip right now and Putting this one back in here makes that one complete. So for the moment, uh, this is the configuration I'm gonna leave. So this one is now double bad, although it's actually triple bad because uh, one of the keys is busted off of this. Um, hmm. Now I do have the key right here. Uh, it's a stem that's just snapped off. So uh, I could fix that. I would just need to get a spring to put in there. So that can be mended. We do still need to look at the space bar for the other one though so we're gonna do that here in a moment but uh yeah what i think i want to do for my original vic 20 is set it aside and figure out a solution for the eprom uh that way it can work without having to borrow a part from another one and <laughs> i really want to make this actual unit work with as many of its original parts as i can because, frankly, it seems like the future of Commodore hardware is to just get a bunch of machines and then consolidate them into an ever-decreasing number of functioning units. So, I don't want to do that here. I want to leave this one as is, and I want to leave this one as is, and try to not consolidate parts. Now, the VIC chip is a custom part. And when I say VIC chip, what I mean is the video generator chip. It is what actually drives the graphics and everything for this machine. I think it's responsible for sound too. Um, so that part is proprietary to the VIC-20, which it's, it's is a really bad name with the VIC chip and the VIC-20. I, I didn't come up with this stuff. It may seem a little weird that I'm just giving away the VIC chip to the person who has the other VIC-20, but they really want a VIC-20, and I'd rather them have that so uh, they can actually use it. Um, so for right now, that's a solution that needs to be found. Uh, but at least I know exactly what's wrong with this thing going forward. Frankly, knowing what's wrong with it to me is more relieving than actually having it working because I also have one that works. So this is just gonna go on the shelf back here as a future project. So for now, let's focus on the keyboard of this one. Now the keyboard is screwed in, so let's go ahead and remove those.
Now I can see uh, the space bar, how it's mounted, and I can actually get under it and wedge it uh, up, which will be a lot safer. There's less to that than I anticipated. Um, apparently I'm gonna have to take off the entire back. Let's go ahead and do that, I guess. How's that? How's that work? Ah, you kidding me? All right, well, hopefully we can just see the space bar mechanism. Oh no, they're carbon pads. Ah, oh, great, okay. Well, I know it needs to be done. I don't see a way of removing this without desoldering those tabs, so that's stupid. Um, and I have to, because I think I'm gonna have to put some pencil lead on a rubber pad for this space bar. Okay, so that's the switch for the space bar. Actually, it just looks like a bug got in there and made it really dirty because all the other ones look fine. But then look at the space bar switch just compared to all the other ones. So you know what? I think it's just dirty and I might get away with an easy solution here. This is a very weird switch type. So that's soft and actually compresses and flexes on the clear piece. So I can rub it off on there. Um, and it looks like I got some gook off. Uh, so yeah, I suspect I'm going to put this on and... It'll just work fine after that. All right, I am just gonna go ahead and put the entire thing back together because uh, I'm pretty sure that was just about the easiest fix you could ever possibly have. There we go. Let me get the television set up and let's test that space bar. All right, applying power. RF modulator had to kick in there. Color looks maybe a little wonky on this one, and I'm realizing I forgot to put the uh, RF shield back on. But, a hey, space bar. That makes this one completely fully functional. <laughs> awesome. Well, that's that one completely solved, which is really awesome. Uh, I probably should have run that dead test cart on it, uh, but I'll do that in a little bit, because for now, we're actually going to take a look at the one that has my VIC chip in it uh, that is not my uh, VIC-20. There are two things that need to be addressed with this one. One is that the uh, leveling bar for the uh, space bar has broke off on the right side so it doesn't go down correctly anymore. And you can actually tell this is a different keyboard than the other two. So even if I wanted to, I can't actually swap parts between them, I think. So that just needs to be fixed. And the other thing is that I'm going to apply heat sinks to the more critical chips in this, all of the MOS ones. Um, they thought it would be a good idea to prolong its life and um, I don't really have any disagreements with that after my experiences with dead MOS chips. So uh, yeah, we're gonna go ahead and do that. All right, let's get the third VIC-20 of the day open. So, immediately, you can tell this is a very different board revision than the uh, other two are. So it's uh, not even really guaranteed that parts will be cross-compatible, although that character or basic ROM there may work in the other one. I didn't really try part swapping like that because it didn't really seem worth it. But it has a lot of the same other stuff going on like the uh, 2200 UF axial cap there. That's probably C44, oh, C40 on this one. And then there's some electrolytics under the RF chip and you can see my VIC chip there. That is good. But uh, this is uh, this machine and here is that keyboard. Yeah, that's definitely a different keyboard. The locking caps lock key is in a different orientation. I'm gonna go ahead and just take this out first, uh, just so that I can see it um, and get an idea of what it would take to fix that space bar. All right, I am going to gently pull up on this. Yeah, that is a completely different mechanism, I believe. So it's actually a piece that fits in there. Um, the other one is intact on that side. They are identical, um, aside from, you know, being broken. Uh, so that seems rife for 3D printing. All right, I was able to pry it out. So if I can come up with a model for this, um, I could get this printed in resin 
and just replace it. That should work totally fine. Now I bet the super glue and baking soda trick would also work, but that's pretty thin there. Uh, but I bet you could come up with something because realistically you just need a loop on that. Uh, that's all the other one is. So that wouldn't be too hard to do, but I think I want to try 3D printing that. I wonder if anyone's actually just made a model already. I wouldn't even know what would be the best way to search for that, but possibly. Stabilizer, that's the word. It hit me as I was walking back to the computer. Anyway, uh, for the stabilizer mounts, um, I think I'm going to have to model that myself and then go ahead and print it because I don't see any existing models online. Um, so if I get that done and working by the time I uh, have this video finished, I'll interject that here because I'll probably end up doing that at home uh, so I can take my time on the model. For now, I'm going to go ahead and put the heat sinks on the chips, but Let's see if I have success with this first. I was actually able to repair this, so let's go through the steps that I used to do this. First, I grabbed the part that I needed to repair and my calipers so that I could get all of the measurements that I would need for it. Next, I started building up a model in OpenSCAD. I divided this model into two major parts, the mounting stem and then the loop portion that holds onto the stabilizer bar. Now it seemed like the top part of the model actually had three components to it, a solid core that I called the base, the loop portion that the stabilizer bar goes through, and then the little part that pokes off the top, which I suspect is an end stop that keeps the space bar from being pressed all the way down and crushing the spring. So I wanted to make sure that I got all of those parts specified. I did, however, deviate from the original part design by making it overall thicker, matching the width of the key stem mount. The originals are only about half of that width, but there's no real reason to do that. I suspect they did it for injection molding purposes. So I was not held by that constraint, and it just makes the part stronger in the long run. The only other really difficult part of this was that the top is at a slight angle downwards, which I didn't really have a good way of measuring. So in the end, I just ended up making the model view really small and holding up the physical part to my monitor until it looked about right. Worst case, I print two and then I have it be slightly wrong together, but I actually managed to get it pretty much identical. So with that, I had a model that I was ready to print. I brought my design files to a resin printer I have access to and was able to let it go. These parts are really tiny, so we can't actually see them emerge from the resin reservoir. So let's just move on to them being finished. And here we are. This is the original part and my replacement. You can see how my replacement is just a little bit thicker, but overall the same dimensions. The dimensions are so precise, actually, that it fits perfectly into the key, requiring just the right amount of force to hold it in. Man, resin is kind of awesome for functional prints. But with it in place like that, I slid it over the stabilizer bar, put the original stabilizer mount on the other side, and was able to press the key down and have it work. Both sides of the stabilizer now function, and the key behaves exactly like it should. If anyone else here needs this model to repair their VIC-20, I put it up on GitHub as both the STL that I printed directly and the SCAD files in case you need to modify it for some reason. All right, well, hopefully future Shelby got that all knocked out, and uh, in the future, this will have uh, a good stabilizer. For now, I'm going to go ahead and put those heat sinks on the chips. All right, now in case anyone who's watching this has been curious to try this on something but hasn't actually done it, uh, you only need a heat sink on the center of the chip. Uh, on the top like that because the die is right there and then there is a lead frame that goes out everywhere else um, and that's all it takes. Let's put the weird different kinds of heat sinks in here. Oh well. Um, so you don't need to put heat sinks all along the entire body of the chip. You're just cooling plastic that doesn't actually get hot if you try and do that. Go ahead and put it on a character ROM first there since that one doesn't work too well on mine. Need that saved. Okay, there we are, all heat synced up. As far as I'm aware, all of the other chips are just standard off the shelf logic, uh, aside from those, those are probably the RAM, uh, Toshiba known for that kind of thing. So uh, yeah, I'm not worried about any of those other parts uh, for heat syncing, it's really just those critical ones that I wanted to make sure I had covered. Time to wrap this up with the Final reassembly of the day. And there is that one back together.
All right, now I'm going to power this thing up in a moment just to, you know, verify before I send it off that it's fully functional. But I thought I would show you here the difference between the new revision and the old revision on the side. Uh, the old one has the AC two prong power switch and the new one has the DIN for the five volt and uh, what is it? nine volt AC output. So yeah, that one's a little weird. And also for some reason, they switched from a horizontal power switch to a vertical one. At least they made it physically impossible to plug the wrong thing into the wrong port. Unlike tier city with the model one. Good job there guys. But this one should work just fine. And it does. Space bar included if we just pretend that I've already stabilized it here. So, three Commodore VIC-20s, two of them actually working now, although I only have enough hardware to make two of them work, and well, I actually only have enough hardware to make one work, but that's fine because I have the two that have the compatible components at least. But all three of them are completely understood at minimum, the two that are totally working. I mean, we know what all works with them, everything, but the one that isn't working, I now know exactly what's wrong with it. And like I said, that's honestly more relieving than knowing that it does work. Like I could transplant the guts from this one into that one, it would be functionally the same, but I wanna actually get that one working at some point. So. Now my quest begins to replace the character ROM, which I think is possible with a EEPROM adapter socket. The VIC chip is gonna be a little more complicated. I would like to get a modern replacement and then put that in this one and then get mine back. Don't know if that exists. I need to do some more research on VIC-20 stuff. I've never had a reason to care because the only one I ever had has been sitting in this box for seven years. So. I now get to enter the world of VIC-20s for the first time. And I think this has been a pretty good introduction to it, at least on the hardware side. And I can't believe it after seven years, I finally know what's wrong with this one. That's <laughs> like, oh, the biggest load off my back. That is really just kind of like, I get, I'm getting tingles in my brain just knowing that I know what's wrong with it. That is such, a crazy thing, I, this computer has just been hanging over me for so long, but I actually finally know what's wrong with it. But that's it for now. If you want to see a potential video in the future on getting this machine going, you may want to subscribe, but again, that's contingent on finding parts. If you want to help support the channel, you may want to find me on Patreon or get a shirt like this one. But that's it for now, and I'll see you guys next time.